Um, this is presented by a, uh, funded by an NSF grant. So, and part of the MAA, AMATIC and ASA are all part of this grant. Um, so just a couple of things I want to let you know about the webinar before we start is that the MAA is in fact recording the webinar. Um, and so we will be posting that so you can see it a little bit later. Um, um, so um, another couple of things I just want to kind of also mention is that um, if you, we will, we will be distributing it on the staff prep website. So if you missed it or you want to see it again, you can watch it again. Um, by participating in this webinar, you are agreeing that your contributions become part of the webinar. So if you don't want that, you can mute yourself. Actually, at the moment, you are muted. If you want to, you can unmute yourself so you can participate a little bit. Um, that is fine, too. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this is, webinar is going to be about little, um, using little apps to teach descriptive statistics. Part of the STAT prep grant, we've actually created little apps um, that you can use in your classrooms. And so I want to show you where those are and show you how they work. And I'm going to use one today to kind of show you how I teach it in my class. Um, my name is Katherine Kozak. I'm at Coconut Community College um, in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm also, I'm part of the staff prep leadership team, and I'm also the president-elect of AMATIC. Uh, so welcome everyone from all those organizations. Um, Danny Kaplan is also part of our leadership team. So he is from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. All right. Um, so we're going to actually talk about the staff prep website at the start, because um, that's what we're going to go into. We're going to look at the structure of the webinar, of the website. Um, where to find low apps and also where to find the tutorials and class lessons we have. So um, the stat prep webinar um, website is just statprep.org. So we're gonna go into that right now. And so this is what our webinar looks like, uh, our website looks like. Um, we have some home that gives you some information about us. We have the different webinars we will be, um, sorry, different hubs we will be hosting here shortly with some, and their, what the workshops will look like. So we've actually had workshops in Los Angeles and um, Minneapolis. Those were the, did the last ones this last summer. And then we just met in Seattle and Hartford, Connecticut this June also. We'll meet again in next summer. And then we have more planned throughout the next few years. Um, this summer, we will also be meeting in Fort Worth, Texas and in the DC area. So hopefully if you haven't attended one, you'll be able to attend one. And hopefully if you did attend one, you found the information useful and that you'll be coming back the second time if you're in the first workshops. Um, again, we do have our webinars posted on here. So you can see all our previous webinars we've done in the past. Um, and then we have our resources. So that's where I wanna go is to our resources. Here we have little apps. They're just things that you can show in your classes. Um, we have a little app on the two sample t-test. We have a little app on regression and smoothers, um, proportions and center and spread, which is the one we're going to be looking at today. And these are just, and we'll show you how they kind of work, but these are just ones that you can use. These are some old ones that you can also look at um, and use in your classes if you want to. Um, we also have tutorials. Um, so these are, we have tutorials on statistical basics with R. Um, random based inference, data wrangling, and modeling. So these are different tutorials you can use that can help you learn the statistics and how to use R, but also if you want to use them in your classes to teach your students how to use R. And then we also have class lessons. Um, those class lessons, we have um, a first day lesson that I actually use this semester. Um, we have some other ones that you can use. Uh, my favorite one is the experiment where they have the students throwing paper airplanes. Another favorite one is using what's normal and what happens with that and what normal means. And then a couple other ones we have. We're going to be dealing with um, a uh, little app. The little app is um, the one that's called Center and Spread. So if you are on the staff prep website and you want to go to that, you can go there and, and play along with me. Or if you want to just watch, you can also just watch. So we're going to go into that. 
Um, it takes a little bit of time to load. All right, so as soon as it's up, um, this is what our little apps look like. They usually have information that's a graphical display of information. Um, they have a response variable here that's displaying the data, whatever you picked. Right now we've picked age. Um, you also have explanatory variables. We'll look at those. And you can change your sample size. And there's some other things we can do. So I would actually use this in my classes to, um, to introduce the concept of center and spread. And I'm going to pick a different variable besides age because that's not all that interesting. Um, this data, by the way, is um, from the uh, national, it's a national survey that was done of students. So we have that information. Um, I'm going to actually pick and work with BMI. So you can see we have all these different variables that are looking at this. National Health put out all of this information on people and collected information. And we have that data. And in this list is BMI. So there's the BMI. And you can see here is a dot plot of the BMI information. You have um, what the BMIs are doing for different people. So how many people are down here around 20? How many people are up here around 40? And of course, 60 is incredibly overweight. So we have one person up there. So that's what each one of these dots represent. If you think 200 is too many to look at for your students, you can actually change the sample size to something a little bit more usable. So let's go to 10 just for the fun of it at the moment. So what I would do with my students is I say, okay, this dot right here represents a person who has a um, BMI of about, looks like about 40 or uh, 38. So that's one person right there. Um, and this is one person whose BMI is around 17. So I would actually work with that and show my students how the different, how these work. Um, you can also take another sample. Um, so down here at the bottom is a button that says new sample. So I can click on that new sample. And um, I see I get different points. So that's the, the joy of this is you can actually show your students that different samples can be taken. These are all random samples taken from that national survey. Um, and this dot here, therefore, is one person whose BMI is around 25. Uh, if you want another new sample, you can do that too. And you can see that it shows it's different. So you can talk about how the difference in the samples are happening and what goes with that. Um, 10 is not a very large sample. So we go to a little bit bigger, bigger sample. So let's go to maybe 50. And then you can see kind of how it's spread out. And you can kind of estimate right now where the center is. It looks like the center is about here. And it looks like it's not, it's got a little bit of a spread. So we can talk about those concepts of what a center is and what a spread is. Um, if you would like to, you can ask them to show the mean. So we can actually click on this and find out what that mean is. So this is the mean for this sample. And if you want to take a new sample, you can do that and then you can see how the mean changes. So this is one thing I like to show my students is how the mean actually can change based on um, taking different samples because the mean is dependent on what sample you take and so forth. If you want to then go into what the standard deviation is, we can actually show that standard deviation. So this is using the idea of one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations above, and below the mean. And so you can say to your students, hey, look, most of our data is within two standard deviations of the mean. There are some people out here. There doesn't seem to be anybody down here. So you can kind of show that. Um, if we want to take a bigger sample, let's go back to our 500 sample. You can now see how the standard deviation might change a little bit with the different samples. And now how you have some outliers out here that are beyond three standard deviations. So you can kind of start introducing those concepts of what those are. Um, um, I can share the source of the data, um, but I have to admit, I can't remember exactly what it is. So I will make sure I find out what the source of that data is and where it's from um, and give you that information. Because I can't remember, I know what it, where it's from, but I can't remember exactly where that data comes from. So let me find that out for everybody. And I will get that information for you. 
All right. Sorry, I'm just trying to look something up. Okay, so let's go back to where we can go with this data. Um, and I get that information to you. Um, you can also, and this is kind of an introduction to things, you can actually get the idea of doing a median or actually show a, a, a confidence interval. So you can actually show the median and a 95% um, coverage interval. So you can see the median and the mean are pretty close in this sample because the mean median is this blue line right here and the median mean is a red line. Um, you can also do an, a confidence interval. So you can kind of introduce that concept of a confidence interval to your students right today. I can say, hey, this is what the confidence interval looks like. This is where the mean is roughly. Now, in reality, in statistics, we don't really spend a lot of time on just a single variable. We spend a lot of time in our classes doing that, but we don't spend as much time as we'd like to to do that. So we want to find out kind of where that information comes from and what we can look with it. And um, so what we want to do is we might, we actually like two variables. So we might actually have an explanatory variable here. And let's look at the explanatory variable and let's pick one of our many explanatory variables. So as an example, we could look at what is the BMI doing with maybe, um, let's say, let's look at physical active. So you can see here, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off the confidence interval at the moment, but you can look at this and see, hey, people who are, n are not physical active, they have a BMI about here, which looks to be about 30, and people who are physical active have a BMI that's a bit lower. So we can actually start looking at how that interacts and what that looks like and goes with that. So that kind of gives us some information um, of kind of where that all fits together. All right, so, so it's kind of a good way to kind of introduce the concept of the difference between things, difference between things. You can see those the standard deviations are roughly about, they're a little bit smaller for this sample than for this, for the yes people than it is for the no but you can kind of still see what's happening with that. Um, and again, it might help to take another sample and see if that changes. And so I like to do where I show lots of different size sam different samples and keep doing that to show kind of that things do change with each sample. So it looks like at the moment though, that this mean does seem higher than this mean. If you want to, you can show the confidence interval between these and kind of talk about how much is it really a big difference between them. So that's kind of a nice thing to kind of introduce your students to the concepts of what these are and what they are working with. So, um, so I was still trying to find the answer to that question as to where the data came from. And unfortunately, I don't have the exact source so I'm still looking for that source. Um, if I don't get it, I will put it on the, um, when we post the webinar, I'll make sure that it's posted with the webinar so you know where the source of the data is. But I believe it is the um, National Health Survey that's done every, every year. Um, um, if you want to also, by the way, you could change your confidence level. So we can go to a 99% confidence level and see what that changes. So you can do that information also and show the median and that confidence, it's called a coverage interval. So you can do that if you want to. Um, and then if you, then what I would do with my students is say, okay, we're kind of done with BMI. What other um, information would you be interested in? What other thing would you like to look at in terms of this study? So do you want to look at um, maybe poverty and see is with poverty, are things more spread out than others? I'm gonna turn off the confidence interval. But looking here at the means, again, I, I like to use this to kind of teach the idea of the means. And I can see, hey, people who are physical active, um, there, doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a difference between those who are physical active 
and how much poverty they have. Um, this is their poverty level. Um, the lower the number, the more poverty they have. Um, the higher the number, a little bit less poverty. So you can kind of see where that fills in. Um, you could pick other things. You could pick other home ownership. Um, and this one actually is nice because it has three different things. We have ownership, renting, and if you're some other to where you don't have a home or you're living with somebody else, that would be with the other category. And so we have this information from these different places. So again, you can really see, hey, this means for if you own a home, you're most likely to have to not be, pov be in poverty than if you don't own a home. But there's other response variables you can pick on and work with. And so that's what I do. Um, so the, there is, the, the difference between the different colors is this is actually the, the interval for, this is the mean for this group here, and it's just red, so just say this is the mean for this group. Um, this group is colored green just to show that they're a little different, just to make them different. And this one has the red here, um, the green here, because the color we picked there was green for them. And then the other is blue, um, and there's not very many of them, so this data probably isn't very accurate as to what that would be. Um, so it's just a different colors just to keep people, keep the things kind of separated and what's going on. The black intervals, so the red line here is your means. The black interval is your standard deviation. So this kind of shows you here's your center, you're one standard deviation away, one standard deviation below, two standard deviations below, and it kind of shows you the spread that you would be. So that's kind of what I use with those. And again, I would just, I would at this point open up to my students and say, what would you be interested in? Are you interested in cholesterol? And maybe looking at cholesterol and physical active. And you can see that people who are not physical active have a slightly higher um, mean than people who are. The spreads look to be about the same because this spread is the spread for standard deviation is this black line here. And this black line here is the spread for standard deviation for the yes group. They look about the same um, and so forth. So you can kind of talk about those. And yes, they're not actually calculating any of these, um, but they are in fact, um, uh, they are in fact doing a, uh, they're just seeing kind of what there is. They're getting more intuitive ideas. Um, so I was asked about the confidence intervals. I was looking at these and I, I wish Danny was here today because he could explain a little more about these. Um, these don't look to be what I thought they would be. So I'm not sure this is supposed to be a confidence interval for the mean. And the mean difference is actually probably what these are, but I don't, I don't understand what these are doing. So I have to, unfortunately, Danny is not here today for me to explain those. So I probably wouldn't show those to my students, but this kind of concept is what they are. I would probably just spend time with my students with the mean and standard deviation to give them an intuitive idea of what the center is because you can see this does look like the center of the red data. And this does look like the center of the green data. And so giving them that idea of what that looks like. And so that's what I kind of would do is go through that, pick different things. Now, if you do want your students to um, be actually able to calculate these things, we do have the technology for doing that. So um, again, First, I'd like to kind of talk about where does it fit in. I kind of been talking about that all along, is that I would actually kind of not spend time having my students calculate standard deviation and mean. Um, I'd finally, I'd rather have them have an intuitive idea of what those are. So that's kind of where I would go is where they would fit in. It's kind of replacing my discussion on having how to calculate these with more of an intuitive idea behind them. And then if you do want to teach your students how to do that, in R, um, we do have a, a classroom lesson or a tutorial for that. So I'm going to open that one up. Um, and so this is what a lot of our tutorials or lessons look like, is they kind of give you on the side, this one is descriptive statistics, and it gives you on the side kind of different pages we're going to go to. It'll give you an, a little bit of information about what we're starting with and what we're going to be dealing with. Um, and kind of how to do these calculations because a lot of our classes we do have to calculate them. 
I don't make my students calculate anything by hand. I make them do everything on a computer. Um, I used to use graphing calculators. I don't use those anymore. I find that they're very limited in what they can do, and this is much better. So the, what I want to go on is if we go to organizing statistics, we can actually talk about how we do this. Um, we are going to be using, um, basically this is R. It doesn't look like R. It just, it's a, it allows you to actually do the code of R. Um, this data is the Galton data. This was actually collected by Fisher back in the late, um, early 1900s, um, that he was collecting information on student, um, on people, families' weight, um, their height, their um, ages, and so forth. And um, if you look in the chat, the you can go to this one also and go into the signing this app and see how it works. So we're going to go ahead and actually do this. This is actually the command in R to create this. Um, you have to have Mosaic and GFF. Ggplot um, installed on your R, but if you're using R Studio, they're not hard to install. Um, we just started using R Studio for our students this semester, and um, I have all of the packages that I need already in in the computer in the um, package with my students. Um, but df means data function, so I like to tell my students that this is the kind of the function. This is not an algebra course, but this is kind of like a function. And then the parentheses are the argument for that function. So we're going to use df underscore stats because we want to do a data function creating the stats. And then the parentheses says, okay, now do it on this. We use the tilde. Um, that tilde is a way to um, tell R, this is the variable I want to work with. It's not really what that means. It means a lot of different things, but one of the main things that kind of can be thought of as meaning is this is the variable I want you to work with and where I want you to go. Um, we can also do other things with it and you'll see that when we get a little bit farther as to what that total can also do. And then we need to tell it where the data set is. We're using the data set Gelton. And that is also one that is that you can load into the R um, automatically. And then we want to have it find us the mean. And then if we just come over here, we can have it run that code. And you'll see it comes out. It only has, it has a one row here because it's just letting you know that it calculated this. And it's finding the mean height of these people. Um, so the way I actually have created R, um, my, class, my college actually has an R Studio license, which is free as long as you can prove to R Studio that you're using um, or that you can put to our studio that it's in your, in your syllabus that you're actually going to be using, required in your classes. It is free. My students, my IT department then installed that R Studio into, onto a server here on our campus. And our students log in with the login they use for campus um, computers. So they only have one login they have to know. And then my students have, I've been able to tell my IT people what packages I want them to have installed. And then we are actually loaded and then we just install them whenever we need to use them in our classes. Um, and so my students were actually able to do that. My classroom, we have computers in the classroom. Um, some of my students bring in laptops if they have them. You can actually do this on your phone. Our studio can be run on a phone, though I wouldn't want to do it on my phone, but it's amazing what some of these younger students like to look on on their phone. Um, so you can use a phone, you can use a tablet, you can use a computer, and it doesn't matter what kind of computer. And that's one reason we went to our studio over and, and log in for our studio as opposed to using just an R download is um, it will work on uh, Chrome because they just log into an R studio through their browser. So they just go to a website that's their R studio login and it brings our studio straight to them. So our students who have Chromebooks actually can use this. And that was one of our problems we had. All right, so back to this of what we're going to do. So I now will be teaching my students in class, probably using this exact webinar, I'm mean, sorry, this exact um, uh, lesson here to have my students learn how to go ahead and do 
um, things with their, compu their, their computers. So we calculate the mean height, but if you want to, you can change this to anything else. If you want to, you can make this into median, and then it will calculate the median for you. And so here it is, whoops, I then have to hit run code. And now it gives us the median. And in fact, if you want to, you can have it do the mean, the median. And if you want to, you can even do the standard deviation. And it will actually give you all of those things, the mean height, the median height, and the standard deviation of your height. So you can actually get those calculations for you. I grant you, I'm not making my students calculate these by hand, but I haven't done that for years. So, um, and they don't seem to have a problem with understanding what these things are by not actually having them calculate them by hand. I do have my students in class doing these on their own so they can see how it works. Um, we can also, and this is the nice thing about the tilde notation, so I wanna do height, but I wanna base it on height in terms of, let's say, looking at different genders or different sexes. So I can actually, and if you want to, we can actually look at this data. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in Galton. Um, R is very case sensitive. So you notice the first time I typed it, I spoke in a little G and now I change it to a big G. So I tell my students that all the time, be very careful. And you can kind of look at this data. So what this is, is the, this is a family net number, their father's, um, this is their father's height, I believe, mother's height, the sex of the person, hopefully. Um, and then, oh wait, I think these are the mother and father um, yeah, I think these are their heights. And then this is the height of the person, the kid. So this is the gender of the kid, and this is the height of the kid, and then this is the number of kids that are in that family. So this first family has four people in the family, um, the four kids in the family, and this first few people are all the same family. So this is all the same family, and this is the different heights of this is a kid who's four female. This is a kid who's also female. There must be twins. This is another female kid. Maybe there's triplets. And then here's a male child. So you can kind of see how that all kind of fits together. And then you can see this family here. So if you want to look at the data, we can look at this um, and see what's happening. But let's say I want to see, is there a difference between means for um, different genders? So we can actually run the code. Again, we're going to use DF stats. Um, it's really nice because the DS stats pretty much does everything. And then the height is going to come first and the tilde says, take the height and separate it by the sex. So the word that comes after the tilde is what you want to separate it based on. Sex is a quantitative, a qualitative variable and you can see it's up here as a qualitative variable. Height is a quantitative variable. So you do need to start with a quantitative, you're going to do stats and then a qualitative variable here. And again, data equals skeleton tells R where the data set is. And then this time, I'm going to do a confidence interval for the mean. So again, I'm going to run it. And you can see now we had the female data here and their lower limit of their confidence interval and their upper limit. And then we had the male data here, lower limit and upper limit. Okay. So um, one thing I want to point out is the way these work with the TOTA is if you're only gonna have one data, one variable like we did up here, let's start this one over again. The one variable up here where we didn't separate it based on another variable, the tilde has to come first. And if we have two, then the tilde can go in between. And then this is nice because it actually has the students kind of playing around a little bit with it, playing some things. Um, the help command is a wonderful thing in R because it actually gives people a chance to It'll tell you kind of what's going on in that data set and some information about it. So the, this variable of kids' feet, the data was collected by a statistician um, in her fourth grade classroom in some place. So you can find out information about the data set. They usually have little vignettes about each data set here. And so I would just keep playing with this and let my students see kind of what they can do. And then this one, actually allows your students to kind of play around a bit more with it to where they're actually having to put in what information they want. So we're going to use the DF stats to construct a data table which will break down the mean width for the four groups. Girls whose bigger feet 
foot is the right foot and boys whose bigger foot is the right foot. Girls whose bigger foot is the left and boys whose bigger foot is the right. I mean, sorry, left also. So we might do, let's say we're gonna do width and we wanna, might wanna do um, bigger foot and then we might wanna do with, um, maybe we'll do uh, sex. And then we see if that works. And so now we can see the sex is boy or girl and what their left foot is, if their left foot is the bigger foot, what does it mean with? And if their bigger foot is the right foot, what does it mean with and so forth. So these are just kind of things that they can play around with and see how things work and see what happens. And then this is the kind of, because one of the frustrations my students have is that they never, they get things wrong and then they don't know what's wrong. So this exercise here kind of lets you see what's wrong. If we run this code exactly as it is, it'll say it can't find this. So you can see, hey, I might've missed something here. Remember, it's not just D, it's data function. So it's DF and then stats. So now let's see what happens when we fix that mistake. Now it says it can't find kids' feet. So we then see, oh, well, kids' feet supposed to be capital. So we're gonna go ahead and capitalize that kids' feet. And then, oh, and feet was capitalized also. So you gotta be very careful about how things are capitalized. And then it says, SEXX is not found, so we know how I need to get rid of one of those X's because there's too many. And then if we run it again, it doesn't know what mean is because we obviously didn't spell mean correctly. So this is a nice one because it gets the students a chance to kind of play around and see kind of what can go wrong. And then there's more topics in these and that you can go through this kind of similar things that we just went through. So, now what I'd like to do, and, and like I said, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but it just gives you a chance to kind of play around with all those and see how things work. So I kind of like to go back to this, the discussion and talk about how do I actually assess this data? Um, so one thing I do is I do teach my students the R. So I actually do make them learn R in my classes and they've been able to learn it just fine. Um, at first, it's not great. I do give them all the commands. So it's not like they have to remember commands but I do give them all the commands so they can work through it. So in their homework problems, I do make them use the R programs. Um, and then the way I would test it is I would, um, I would make the computers available. If I have computers available, which I do in my classes have computers available. So if you have computers available and you can lock down the browser to only be on a certain page, I know my software at my computer my, my IT department on our computer has actually done that to where you can actually lock down um, to a certain browser that they can only use. Um, then I'd be fine giving them an in-class test using this information. If you don't have computers available, what you could do and what I actually do for my, my take-home test that I give at the end of the semester is I actually give them the printout from R or I give them the printout from the little app and say, Tell me what you can about this. What information could you give me from this? So it's more of a conceptual question and not a can you produce it kind of questions. Which really the, the computation is not as important to me as it is the conceptual understanding of it. So that's the other thing I can do. Um, the uh, thing I actually do in my classes is I'm allowed to give take home tests if I want to because I have the, the freedom to do that. And so I actually give a take home test and it's not the normal take-home test that you're used to. It is a take-home test um, from, um, that is a little bit more work. So you can see the link is here, but I'm gonna go to that link and show you kind of what my take-home test looks like. And it, it's, I doesn't, it's not where you fill things in. I mean, they have to do their work on their own paper. Um, and I asked my students, you know, here's a data set find me all these different things, label these different things, find me a, I actually have a pie chart in here, but I'm not teaching pie charts this semester. So I have to change that to a bar chart. Um, and then have them write me a summary of that. 
and um, I have that where this is all just qualitative data to where I'm having them do a bar chart of it and telling me kind of what story does the chart give them. Um, and then I do grade them based on how well their chart was created. And then I, um, I then have them hand in all this information. I'm big in them understanding the definitions of what a population and sample are. So I make them go and write that information for me to see can they actually take a situation and write it. Um, and then I then go into a qualitative data. So I have a problem that's on a qualitative, um, sorry, a qualitative, quantitative variable. I do a quantitative variable and this one is actually temperature data for males and females. And then I have them look at um, kind of comparing them. Tell me what is the similarity and differences between them. Um, give me all the means, medians, modes, and all the descriptive statistics you can on them. Draw me some histograms of them. I'm probably changing that for this semester because I don't really um, do histograms as much as I used to, but I'll probably do a little different things here. Um, draw me a box and whisker plot, and then give me some information, summarize what you found between these two data sets. Um, I then have them do a stem and leaf plot. And again, the same idea of tell me kind of what this data is, what's going on. And then I do a, stem, a time series plot. Uh, again, just to kind of, again, have them tell me any stories it gives. Um, another scatter plot that gives the idea of um, um, if into the, uh, um, into what kind of, uh, correlation and causation kind of things. And then I'm gonna finish the test. Then I have the last question is where I'm having them actually take a sample from some data I gave them and then find mean and median mode and do the same thing and kind of talk about what those samples look like. Um, so a couple of questions I wanted to make sure you knew about my students. I am at a community college. This is an introductory statistics course. They have had college level math is about all they've had. Some of them have had pre-calculus, some of them have had calculus or college algebra, um, but this is just an introductory statistics course. So my students are about probably the level of your students. This is the first time some of them have even played with a computer much. Uh, they are fine doing it. They learn it all, they go through it. Um, then to get their own data into our studio, there is a way in our studio, and I can go ahead and bring up my R Studio yes, server. So I'll show you what my R Studio service looks like. So again, this is for just Coconino. So this is the one that will get us into this. This is our credentials for my school. And then I get into our studio. And in our studio, um, I was playing around the other day. It actually saves what you were doing. So that's kind of nice. It doesn't make that all go away. So this is actually a density plot that I was able to create in our studio. Um, I have the data that I, my students can read in. I haven't learned how to create packages yet. And so um, I'm working on that this semester to create packages. But right now I just have a GitHub account that my students can get access. To. I get in the URL for that and they can read that, bring their data into it. And then all the data is in there. But they also can um, upload data. So in here, if you click on this window here, so this is the RStudio console. I guess I should go back to that real fast. Um, this is actually the console of where you type most of the things you're gonna do in. This is actually the data set that we could work with. This is the environment. So these are actually all the different data sets that I have actually read into mine that my students will be reading into theirs. And if I click on one, right now I'm in grades, but if I click on, let's say I click on um, annual, that happens to be one of my data sets. Here's my data. If I click on birth control, here's a great one because it gives the location, the type, the method, the year, um, the data type, and the percentile that uses that. So in the country of Belize, 33.5% use abstinence. So this is just different data you can look at um, that I've created in here. Um, it's another one where it gives you the type, whether they have our normal brain or have schizophrenia and then what their brain volume is. These are all things that are from my course that I teach in my book. And I was able to put this information in. And then you can actually upload, you can just go and choose your file. Um, 
most of them should be CV, CSV files. That's the easiest ones to bring in. I don't have, I don't have one. Well, maybe I do have one that I can bring in. So let's see if I can find one on my data set. Um, wait, let me, sorry. I gotta find them on my computer. So let me go into my data sets and let's see, I've got one here that is, uh, um, yeah, this is a CSV file, this is Australian. I don't know what this data is until I open it, um, but it's some data from Australian. And then I can say, okay, I wanna open that. And then it'll bring that data set in for me and then I can click on it and I can actually import it. Oops. And then I can tell it to import it and then it comes right in and there is my data set. So this is actually the assets that the Australian government had um, over a certain time period. So that's what this data set is. And then we can do different things with it. So I can import them by just doing that upload and then import it and then it puts it right up here into my information. And I can do different things with the RStudio. So I give my students this ability to get in here and they do with it. Um, I did not set up my RStudio. I actually told my IT department I wanted to get RStudio and they set up the server for me. So um, I just let them know I wanted it. They then came back and said, no, it costs $10,000. And I went back to them saying, no, it's free. If as long as we're an educational unit and I have it on my syllabus that is required, I sent them my syllabus and they sent that off to our studio. And then our studio was able to um, give them information on how to put it up. They said it was, they thought it was going to be really long and they, I got them back in June. I brought this up, the idea of putting our studio in. Actually, it was the end of June that I said, I really want to get our studio. And by July, middle of July, they had it set up. So it wasn't hard for my IT department to get one set up. They were able to do it without any problems. And one of the guys is in charge of kind of looking it over and watching it. And he says, it's not that hard to, to work and maintain. So my IT department was pretty well willing to do this, but they didn't find it a difficult thing to put together. So that's my RStudio server. So now let's go back to, um, and you're gonna notice here in the test, I actually in here, when I go back to my test, I actually give them the thing that will bring this data set in. So this is the marijuana. So I actually give them the name of it. And then I tell them I'm gonna read, the, I actually have to change this because this is not correct, but I would read in a CSV file. Then I would give them the, the login for the web address for my GitHub account and then the name of the file. So I have to change this. This is actually not the data set I would use this semester anyhow because I used it last spring, but this is kind of what I would go through and use. Um, the data actually came from, so the data for my textbook came from my textbook. I actually have the access to that data set because I actually wrote my textbook. Um, I, um, I actually, uh, um, was able to, um, I had a sabbatical and I wrote a textbook because I wasn't really happy with the textbooks that existed out there. And so I have the data sets available to me that way. Um, if you get a, a publisher textbook, a lot of time they have the data sets available for you somewhere else. Um, I got the data for those from just kind of searching around. I was in Australia for a, my sabbatical and I went up and looked up data there. Um, and then I, for the data for my test, I actually got this test from this idea of a test from a friend of mine. And once I got the idea of his and what he was using for the data, I was able to start looking for that kind of data. And believe it or not, when you Google, like if you Google, like Google marijuana, the data comes up, you can find information. The World Health Organization has tons of data sets you can go and get into. Um, that's where a lot of these came from. But a lot of times I just Google, hey, I'd like to do something on this and I see kind of what data I can find from it. So that's usually where I get this information is, um, is searching that way. Um, I was also asked the question of which is more friendly, R or R Studio. And I have to tell you after using both, R Studio is way more user friendly 
putting data into R was very difficult. Putting it into R Studio is much easier. Um, the other thing though is I started with R. So if you're new to doing this and actually creating, putting R into your classes, I actually started with R. I made up a, a fire I give out to my students or a PDF file that I give out to my students that kind of talks about how to do things in R. Um, and then, then they, I was able to kind of learn how to do things with R. R Studio would do all the things that R did. It's just a little bit more user friendly for the students. Um, but I was using R up until this semester and I found it okay. And it was the way I kind of learned how to put this kind of stuff into my classes. I used to use, like I said, I used to use graphing calculators and about four years ago, I said, no, I kind of want to use computer program and R seemed like the best idea because it's free. So I started using R and now this year I started using R studio and I'm really glad I went to the R studio. I think it's going to be much easier on my students. There's a couple of things I don't like about it, but mostly it's okay. Um, the, I should say, wait, I'm um, sorry, let me go back. Um, go back for just a second. I want to actually go back out, ah, can't, out of here. For just a second, I wanted to go back. If you go to the staff prep website, there is actually under, under about, actually under, Plus, there is suggestions for data sets. So we also have some data sets here that you can use and find. There are data sets built into our studio also that will work on it. Um, so, um, so there are different things that you can use for data sets, but I've actually found most of my data sets by just Googling something I'm interested in. Like I said, the World Health Organization, the um, um, Google has tons of data sets for free that you can use, that you can access for free. So it's, I just usually go into those two places. CDC has lots of great data. Um, I haven't actually had my students using R Studio but getting it downloaded onto their computers. So that question was asked is, if it's run on their own computers, do they need to learn R HTML file? Um, I believe if they just download, actually, I, I did download R Studio onto my computer just by itself, and I did not need to learn R. So I just needed to load in the different ones I wanted to have, and it worked. So I just made sure I had installed certain packages I wanted to have. Um, so the uh, last thing I just wanted to kind of mention, kind of going back to where we were, is you've been asking lots and lots of questions, and I'm hoping I've answered most of them. Um, you're more than welcome to ask more questions. So if you have any more questions and you would like to speak, we can certainly do that if you want to actually come on and talk instead of typing, that'd be fine. Um, I can also, um, if you go to the Stat Prep website, my, it has the information of all of our contact information. I am more than welcome to answer questions through um, email. I gladly do that. I will share anything with you. You have my tests, you ever log, find that. Um, I do change it every semester or try to every semester. Um, but I also will share anything I've created. So um, please let me know if there's anything else you need. So are there any other questions that I can answer? Well, I'm not hearing any questions. I want to thank you for taking your time to be here. I hope you got some ideas of how you would use this in your classes. Hold on, um, Kate. Yes, you go ahead. People who are trying to speak, so I'm, I'm muting them now, okay? Okay. Go ahead, Andre. Hey, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, yes. Oh, thank, well, first, thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, given the fact that this course requires a lot more in terms of learning to program, do, um, is it equivalent to the traditional intro stats class or do you label it differently in the, um, in the catalog or in the, the, you know, the schedule, the course schedule, um, to, so students recognize that this is not, this does like kind of have a computer science component to it? Um, I actually don't label anything different. It transfers to our universities directly as um, a, uh, 
uh, stats class that they have at the universities. It's just an intro to stats course. I just require them to do some of this. I do give them most of the stuff that they have to do so that they don't have to kind of really learn too much programming. Mm -hmm. to give you an example. I had a student who was in my class last fall in stats and I was, I taught them all. And he was a C student. He wasn't my best student, but he was a C student. I had him again in spring in a business calculus class. And in the business calculus class, we were teaching about um, finding the normal distribution and finding probabilities with that. And in that class, I had to use a graphing calculator. And he said to my students, oh, I'll show you how to do it in R. It's so much easier. Yep. Yep. That makes so sense. Even, even students, they, 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 at first, they get really nervous about it. But most of the students by the end of the semester were fine with it. And they, they were having a good time with the R. So even though it has a, that computer science to it, they don't really see it as being a computer science class. And the way our classes work also is we actually have the math stats class and we have a psych stats class and we have a um, business stats class. And our math stats and our business stats are actually offered at the same time in the same room with the same teacher. So that we can have a little bit more flexibility for offering classes. So the business students actually are getting the same thing the math students are getting. Our psych stats has just decided to start using R also. Got you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, you have one more from Yudani, one second. Go ahead, Yudani. Hi, Kate. Uh -huh. um, question is about the Little Labs. I just want to know if you have any like set worksheets to go with Little Labs, or is it just something you just pull up in class and sort of talk about it? Or do you have any like written out tutorials or worksheets to sort of like you can give a handout and ask them to look at you know little labs or so it depends on what i'm teaching that certain day um okay, okay. i actually have a worksheet for doing finding mean median mode and standard deviation and all that fun stuff um that i created my myself that actually shows them that you are i have to update it because we're now using our studio but i'm going to be doing that in the next couple of days um and then i have a worksheet for when i do um uh, t tests later on in the semester and confidence intervals. So I do actually have some worksheets for those. I'm more than welcome to share them if you email me. Um, okay. And then, um, but some of it I don't give them worksheets. Like right now, we're starting to do um, descriptive. We're just starting to do graphical statistics, uh, graphical descriptions of data, and I'm just going to go through in my class and talk about it. I use a smart board in my class, so I can actually copy what I typed into R into my smart board notes and then I post my notes. Oh, okay. I, because I was just thinking if I were to just do an open discussion about like one of those center spread kind of uh, with apps or can I actually give them a tutorial, like a paper, like a printout and say, okay, go to little apps and like, look at this. Um, I don't actually give them something to do. I just have them go to the little apps and then kind of write what they get from it. So, so I don't actually like a discussion. <laughs> yeah. So I usually okay. do it as an in-class in discussion and have them kind of summarize what they see. Um, and then some of the class lessons, I have them actually um, write out kind of what they, um, um, what they're actually doing. Um, I do one of the class lessons and I have them write kind of their conclusions from the class lesson. So oh, it on which one okay. And then I'm, um, they was asked how much time in my class is dedicated to our programming. It's, it's, it's kind of the same amount of time that was dedicated to showing them how to do the calculations by hand. So I don't make them do any calculations by hand pretty much in my class. And so instead of showing them how to calculate the variation using the formula, I usually show them how to calculate the variation using R. So I've just replaced that component of doing calculations by hand with the R component. So it actually doesn't take any more time in my classes than what I was doing before. Yeah, no, I mean, we do sort of use tech from COC. So we do use uh, tech in class. So I just wanted to see if it is gonna be like an open discussion kind of a thing in the class. So is it, can I make it like, more, oh, go home and mess with it, you know, talk a little right. bit and see if you can figure and, it out, okay. Yeah, you can and probably I can write a worksheet as well. In yeah, that it depends on your, your, the, your way you teach, your, your teaching style also. My class, I try to be more open discussion and 
see what they kind of come up with. And then some of it is worksheets. It just depends on what my plans are for the day. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Kate. All right. Um, so we're almost out of time. Um, if there's not any more questions, I do want to remind you that there is a survey that is available to kind of talk about how this went. Um, and so it would be great if you could fill that out because we do need that for our, our information, um, our, our, for our data stuff. And um, so please fill that out. And like I said, my information is in the, um, my information is on the staff prep website. You're more than welcome to email me and I will share things with you. Just ask me specifically for what you want. Um, I also wanna let you know that we are doing more webinars throughout the semester. So you'll see us, we'll try to do another one. I'm thinking we'll do one in the middle of October sometime or the end of October. And it'll be kind of on how to teach using um, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals using the little apps. Um, and then we'll have another one hopefully at the end of the semester. And then we'll be doing more next semester. We haven't planned all those out, but we'll be sending emails out with that information. I wanna thank everybody for wonderful questions and for being here. This was wonderful.